Hello DEFCON, my name is Michael Ritter and I'm honored to be here. My talk is about historically grown Active Directory environments. My goal is to give you an idea which risks are often present in older AD environments besides the publicly known vulnerabilities. The idea to this talk came after conducting multiple AD security workshops with administrators that were working with AD environments that had more than 20 years of history. Most of them have actually reached quite a high maturity in terms of security measures they had implemented. But still, what was left were the dead bodies in the basement. Okay, let's have a quick look on the agenda. First of all, I will give you a short introduction about myself. After that, I will tell you the story of a fictional company called Dev Enterprises, how they implemented Active Directory in the beginning of the century, and also how they suffered and learned from incidents that happened to them. The third point on the agenda, I will speak about the evolution of Active Directory attacks and security features that were implemented over the last 20 years. And then we will come to the dead bodies in the basement that you can typically find in AD environments. Finally, we will come to a conclusion. So let's start off with a brief introduction about myself. I'm currently working as Principal Security Consultant at SecConsult in Germany. I started working in the IT field in 2005 at a managed services provider and that was the point when I first started to work with Active Directory environments. I came into the offensive security industry about nine years ago. And since then, I have performed dozens of AD related security assessments and workshops. In the recent year, I started to work with the blue team, which was a super interesting experience for me. I started to support our incident response team during their engagements. Doing post compromise assessments to identify possible attack paths in the environment and also to consult the customer regarding post compromise actions. And finally, I want to give a little disclaimer here. I am not a detection engineer, but I'm super curious about the field. So let's come to the story of Dev Enterprises. It's going to be a little tale about a fictional firm that deployed Active Directory in the early stages. The goal of this tale is to better understand historically grown Active Directory environments. In the early 2000s tech boom, Jimmy the Skid Johnson stood out as the IT wizard behind an emerging startup called Dev Enterprises. Always on the lookout for innovative solutions to enhance the company's IT operations, Jimmy came across a product from Microsoft designed to streamline the management of IT resources. Recognizing its potential, he took the initiative to integrate Active Directory into the IT infrastructure of Dev Enterprises. In 2002, Jimmy started to integrate Active Directory into the company's infrastructure, navigating a landscape with limited established best practices. The setup of the AD was very basic. Each user had only one account. Local admin accounts, of course, had static passwords. And the third-party services integrated into the environment were running in context of the built-in administrator. Jimmy, as the sole IT professional, juggled the complexities of managing the Active Directory environment while also handling help desk responsibilities. To simplify his workload, Jimmy delegated some of his administrative tasks to his colleagues. So the years went by and no crucial security incident happened. Or to say it right, was detected until the beginning of 2015, when a bad guy infected the workstation of an employee with malware. The employee called Jimmy and told him his computer behaved weird. So Jimmy connected to the workstation via RDP and the result of this was 
the attacker having access to Jimmy's credentials. With Jimmy's credentials, the attacker was able to pivot through the network and steal important research data of Dev Enterprises. This put the company into a tough time as competitors were able to use the stolen research data for their advantage. And how did the management react? As it was clear that this can never happen again, the management decided to invest into a security team that focuses on the improvement of the overall security in the Dev Enterprises IT infrastructure. One of the key topics raised was the improvement of the resilience of Active Directory against future attacks. So one of the first steps was to make the Active Directory more resilient against lateral movement attacks. Of course, there was no option to build a new Active Directory from scratch. So they had to transform the old one. The new security team changed the, changed the architecture from something that you can see on the left into what you can see in the right. The implementation of admin tiering into their ID architecture was the answer to the previous incident. Let's look what consequences this had for Jimmy. So what you can see here is how Jimmy was working before the incident. Jimmy was using one account for all his activities, his daily office work, server maintenance, and also managing the Active Directory domain. And of course, while I'm speaking to you nowadays, we know this is bad practice in terms of security. However, at the time the domain was built, there were no best practices, so this was how it was. After the transformation, Jimmy's focus in his daily work changed. With the new security team, Jimmy's responsibilities shifted into end-user support and server maintenance. Therefore, the first consequence was that all former domain admins were removed, including Jimmy. Due to the nature of the admin tiering concept, Jimmy had now multiple accounts. His old account was used for daily business activities, such as writing mails and working on documents. For server maintenance task and end user help desk, he was assigned two separate accounts. At first, Jimmy was annoyed to work with all these accounts, but after a while, he got used to it. As part of the implementation of the admin tiering concept, privileged access workstations were introduced. Furthermore, lock-on restrictions between the different tiers were enforced. Next to this, the security team was also in need to find a solution for the management of local administrative accounts. For this, they introduced LAPS, a solution from Microsoft to manage secrets of local administrative accounts. On top of this, for the cleanup of local administrative groups and users, a group policy was implemented. Another important point was the improvement of the user help desk concept. For future help desk sessions, a remote support software was introduced, which did not leave any credentials on the system. And finally, an external security firm was hired to conduct the security assessment on the environment. They confirmed that the environment was in a good security posture at this point of time. Take this little tale as an example how an Active Directory environment could have been transformed during its life cycle. In the real world, an Active Directory environment can undergo multiple transformations reflecting changes in technology, organizational structure, security practices, and administrative philosophies. So after this little tale, I would like to go over to look back on the evolution on Active Directory attacks and also have a look on how the defenses developed over the time. But be sure we will come back to the tale and show the impact of all these changes that were made to the environment. Over the last 25 years, dozens of vulnerabilities and attacks 
related to Active Directory and Windows operating systems were published. This overview shows a list of well-known techniques and vulnerabilities that were used by attackers over the last two decades. And I'm sure this overview is not even complete, but it gives you an idea about the development of attacks over the time. Some of these attacks might have had a smaller impact, and some might have been just simple vulnerabilities that were patched as soon as they were discovered. But what, what I want to point out here is that there are some vulnerabilities and techniques that simply cannot be easily patched because they abuse weaknesses in the protocols that are used within Active Directory environments. To give you an example, the Kerberos Sync technique makes use of the authentication flow in the Kerberos authentication protocol. There's nothing like a patch that can be just applied during a patch day, but there are workarounds. Another thing to point out here is you might have had a security assessment in 2015 that had good results. But if you haven't cared about security in the meantime, seven years later, a simple abuse of an Active Directory Certificate Services vulnerability might break your neck. So let's have a look on the other side of the coin. As a text developed over the time, so have security features that are provided by Microsoft. This overview shows security features that have been released during the last decades. These features can greatly improve the overall security of an Active Directory environment. Some of the controls we can see here are easy to implement and bring a huge benefit in terms of improving the security. Take the integration of flaps, for example. Its deployment is straightforward and yet its impact on security is profound. However, as we can see in many of our security assessments, not every organization has embraced labs. In some cases, its deployment remains partial or even absent. On the other hand, you have security features like Credential Card. Credential Card can bring a huge benefit in terms of security, but it has its prerequisites, such as specific hardware requirements, specific operating system requirements, or there can be compatibility issues with third-party solutions. Such prerequisites can pose challenges, especially in older environments. So where does this leave us? The key takeaway is to remain proactive and informed. Even if certain features cannot achieve complete coverage across your assets, Achieving a, significant, achieving a significant percentage, say like 90%, can still result in a notable enhancement of your overall security posture. Even if mitigations and awareness about well-known vulnerabilities are in place, the challenges presented by historically grown Active Directory environments often extend beyond the typical vulnerabilities. To illustrate this, let's revisit the tale I told earlier. Imagine a company that went through multiple transformations of their environment. They had multiple generations of IT admins employed that of course did not document every configuration change that they did over the last 20 years. They may have taken care and fixed the well-known vulnerabilities that were present over the time but some of the historical configurations in many cases may remain untouched and pose a security threat to the overall security. So what remains are the dead bodies in the basement. Let's have a look on the first topic I want to discuss, AD object permissions. Let's look back at our tale again. In the early 2000s, Jimmy started to deploy Active Directory. Over the time, he and his colleagues created thousands of different AD objects. Some may have been domain administrators, but some others may have been just delegated for specific administration tasks. The four objects that you can see here are just examples. In total, there are 12 different object types in Active Directory that you can create. On this slide, I will explain you 
how permissions work in the context of Active Directory. Every Active Directory object has a so-called security descriptor. A security descriptor is a data structure that contains security-related information associated with an object. It includes the owner. The owner usually can read, modify and set permissions on the object. It includes a DAGL, a discretionary access control list that specifies permissions for users on an object. The DAGL consists of multiple access control entries, so-called ACES. These define the permissions users have on the object. When a permission check is performed, each access control entry will be checked against the users that ask for access until a match is found. The last part is the circle, also called system access control list. It defines what operations on an object should be logged. To better understand what happens when creating new Active Directory objects in terms of permissions, I set up three different scenarios I will present to you. We will look at the resulting object owner and the resulting ACL that are set on the objects after they have been created. So let's have a look on the first situation. We have Jimmy. Jimmy is member of the domain admins. As a member of the domain admins group, Jimmy has inherent group delegated permissions on the user account OU. In this scenario, Jimmy creates the user test1. After creating the user, we can check the permissions on the user. Take a moment and guess. Who will be the object owner and how will the ACL look like from Jimmy's perspective? So let's look at the results of situation one. The object owner is the domain admins group. Having a look at the ACLs, we can see there is no first decree permission for Jimmy. The only ACE that is matching is the domain admins group, which Jimmy is a member of. Let's have a look on the second situation. We have the user Anna Bar. Anna has a user account that is not member of any high privilege group. The IT department got the instructions that Anna should be able to manage user accounts for her department. Therefore, the IT department set delegation permissions on the respective user accounts OU. In this scenario, Anna creates the user test2. After creating the user, we will check the permissions again. Again, take a moment to guess who will be the object owner and how will the ACL look like. Looking at the results of situation 2, we can see Anna Bar is the object owner of the created user test2. Further that, we can see that Anna Bar also has first degree permissions on the created user. So in the third situation, we have the user John Cole. John has a user account that is member of the group IT Germany which is delegated to manage user accounts in the user accounts OU. In this scenario, John creates the user test3. After creating the user, we can check the permissions. Take a moment and guess who will be the object owner and how will the ACL of the new user look like. Looking at the results of situation 3, we can see that John Cole is the object owner of the created user test3. 
This surprisingly differs from the first situation where we actually had similar conditions. Further that, we can see no ACL or ACE where John Cole has first degree permissions on the created test tree user. The ACL that is matching for John Cole is his group membership in the IT Germany group. So let's summarize the results. The object owners in situation 1 and 3 differ, even though most people would think they should be the same. Honestly, I have yet not found an explanation why it is like this. If anyone in the audience can explain this, please feel free to get in touch with me. For the results in situation 2, it is generally seen as a bad practice to give direct delegation permissions to a user. Delegation permissions should always be given to security groups as this eases the management of security permissions in Active Directory. And finally, I come to the question, why could this be a problem in historically grown AD environments? So let's go back to our little tale. Remember the first transformation that happened to Dev Enterprises, where the existing flat architecture was transformed by using the admin tearing concept. In many cases during these transformation projects, it is a common misconception that removing a user from a privileged group will remove all his privileges. And I will show you what I mean in a minute. So we have the user John Cole before the transformation. He used to be a member of the IT Germany group, which used to have group delegated permissions on the OU user accounts. So what typically happens during a transformation project? The user's privileged group memberships, in this case the group membership of the IT Germany group, will be removed. The users then be assumed to have no more control of the objects we can see in the user accounts or you. And this is where we can see a typical misassumption. John Cole can still control the objects that he is an object owner of. Following that, if an attacker would compromise his unprivileged account, the attacker would still be able to compromise all the objects John Cole is an owner of. And these objects might not be only residing in tier 2, they could also be in higher tiers. As a result of this, this can break the entire admin tiering model that was implemented. So how can we hunt for these kind of issues? There is already a very popular tool that is collecting information about critical Active Directory permissions, which is Platon. Next to Platon's excellent ability to visualize attack paths, the underlying graph database Neo4j can also be used for non-graphical queries. In some cases, it might be more efficient to run cipher queries first and then take the results to visualize them in Platon. Let's run a cipher query using the Neo4j web interface. Next to the web interface, we could also use the Neo4j API. But for the sake of simplicity, I will use the web interface in this demonstration. Let's find out which user owns how many objects by using the cipher query shown in the slide. And as we can see in the results, we only have two users that own other objects. But be sure, if you run this query in bigger domains, there could be more than 100 results. After we have obtained users that have ownership of other objects, let's visualize what objects they own. Let's take the results from our cipher queries earlier and visualize them in Platon. We can use the Platon GUI to run some cipher queries to visualize what AD objects 
the users that we identified earlier on. And as you can see in the results, we were able to get a nice overview on the ownership permissions of the user objects we identified earlier. So let's come to a conclusion for the topic AD object permissions. There is a common misconception that cleaning up the group membership during a transformation project will remove all critical permissions. We can try to identify possible issues by using Neo4j and Bloodhound. After the identification, we can start fixing these issues. There are three more very useful Neo4j queries to find little dead bodies in your AD environment, but I will leave this for the workshop. So let's get to the next topic, <clears throat> file permissions on critical shares. As we have discussed, issues that can arise with AD object permissions, there are also file permissions that have to be taken care of. File permissions are often neglected or even completely forgotten during AD transformation projects. For Active Directory, I specifically want to speak about the SysVol and the let logon share. Why these shares? Because they are very critical since they are hosting settings and logon scripts that are deployed throughout the environment. If an attacker is able to compromise a user with critical permissions on one of these shares, this can lead to a full compromise of the Active Directory environment. During my security assessments in the past, I have identified multiple file permission issues on these shares at different customers. And at one point, I started to think this cannot be an administrator setting these kind of permissions because the administrator would have to explicitly set these kind of settings plus ignore the warning that is shown on the right picture. On top of that, I found a discussion on a newsgroup archive. 18 years ago, a user asked in a newsgroup, I do see that authenticated users have full control of the syswall share. I guess by default. Maybe I should train my admins to modify the scripts by going in that way since they aren't domain admins. Okay, so besides the fact that we don't know if the statement reflects the truth, it would be a huge issue if authenticated users have full control on the syswall share. It would basically mean that any user in the domain would be able to modify GPO settings as well as logon scripts. Now, the question is, how can we effectively analyze the permissions on a network share to identify possible high-value targets or misconfigurations? I have provided a collection of powerful shell functions that can be used to perform the analysis. After you've loaded the PowerShell functions, you can start to collect the critical file share permissions on a file share you specified. Following that, you can use the resulting PowerShell object array to get an overview on which users have critical file share permissions. As we can see in our example, we have four non-default identities that have critical file share permissions. In this case, it's very bad that, have, that we have authenticated users in the results. From an attacker perspective, it is also interesting to mark the other users shown in the results as high value targets. Finally, we can use the results from our last step to filter for files that specific users or groups have critical permissions on. As we can see in the results, the user MRI has write permissions on multiple logon scripts. If an attacker is able to compromise this account, he can alter the logon script and get remote command execution on all systems the logon script is applied to. Let's come to a conclusion. File permission issues on NetLogon and SysVol can have severe consequences for the overall security in an Active Directory environment. I still have no explanation why this issue is present in so many older environments. I tried reproducing this issue multiple times 
and I've not been able to reproduce it and gain the same results than I have in older environments. So I can only make assumptions. Maybe in the past there was a patch that was silently delivered by Microsoft that actually fixed a permission issue. Anyways, I would love to get your feedback about the results you get when analyzing your environment. If you have any questions, let me know. You can always write me in the Slack channel. So let's come to conclusion. Let this talk serve as a reminder to look beyond the immediate horizon of well-known vulnerabilities. In many cases, we are up to date with the latest security features and we are getting better in improving the resilience against modern Active Directory and tags. But the unseen may remain our greatest challenge. Historical configurations, which haven't been updated for a long time, can be a hidden danger and quietly undermine even the most modern defenses. Moving forward, remember that securing our systems is about dealing with both the past issues and the current threats. Thank you very much.